Welcome everyone to today's ICC panel on exploring the role of technology in industrial decarbonization. We are here live from COP28, where governments around the world are grappling with the situation that the 1.5 target is becoming more and more difficult to achieve. And it is also very clear that the private sector will have to step up to solve the problems that we are facing on this planet. And the private sector is stepping up. Decarbonization is really at the forefront of what technology leaders are thinking about. And when we look at the statistics, 80% of technologies that we need already exist today. So I have the great privilege to host a panel today of three visionary CEOs. And they are together partnering to tackle the question, how can we as industry scale sustainability, but it has to be an end. For industry, it has to be sustainable and profitable and resilient and competitive. Because we only reach the speed and the scale that we need if together we manage to make this profitable and scalable. I'm Eva Riesenuba, Global Head of Sustainability at Siemens, and I would like to introduce you to my fantastic panelists. First of all, we have Leonardo Francini. Leonardo, could you please join me on stage? <laughs> Leonardo is the CEO of Automotive at Eurogroup Laminations. Eurogroup Laminations is a leading company for rotors and stators, and they have the motto to preserve the planet through efficiency. He also holds a PhD in technology and innovation management. Welcome, Leonardo. Thank you. My second panelist today is Miguel Lopez. Miguel, would you please join me? <laughs> Miguel is CEO of ThyssenKrupp. As you know, ThyssenKrupp is a global industrial and technology company that is focusing on five different areas. It's automotive, decom technology, material service, steel and marine systems. Now, Miguel is also the CEO of that newly formed segment, decom technologies, and, and very passionate about innovation. So we're very glad to have you in our panel today. And my final panelist today is President and CEO, Dr. Roland Bush from Siemens. Siemens is a leading technology company in industry, buildings, electrification, transportation, and healthcare. And we're doing that by combining the real and the digital worlds. Roland Bush has always been very passionate about technology and digitalization, and it's a key for Siemens to transform the everyday for everyone. So let's get started with our panel. When it comes to the sustainability, innovation, and technology. Roland, could you tell us how key leaders feel about that for business? What does it mean leading a business today? Well, I mean, you said it before that sustainability is, um, is not just reducing carbon emissions or using less resources. It's also the way how you, how you stay competitive, how you be more resilient, also profitable. So um, it seems to be an unsolvable equation, but it's not. Uh, the answer is technology. I do believe technology gives us an answer to really go into a new way how we are running our economies. And I'm not talking about low growth, no growth, or negative growth. I still believe that growth is important, but we have to drive growth with less resources. And it's not only uh, carbon emission, it's also critical materials and the like. And I'm pretty sure we'll touch that. So technology is the answer. Um, it's digital technologies as well, but also any kind of technology which allows us to, to reduce the carbon footprint, to run our processes more efficient. Um, and I've, I'm pretty sure that most of the technology is already available. The problem is how can we deploy it even faster than we do today? Thank you very much. So what does that mean for um, ThyssenKrupp, Miguel? Well, we have um, basically two very big topics in front of us, very big tasks. 
Uh, one is uh, for sure to get our steel uh, production decarbonized. And of course, this is only possible uh, through technology, as you mentioned before, Roland. And, and on the other hand, in this green transformation um, arena, we have the, you mentioned it before, the decarbon technologies where, and for sure we'll come later a little bit more into the detail, where we help others, where we help customers to, to decarbonize and to reduce uh, emissions. Uh, it is very exciting, by the way, uh, all the, the conversations that we have around COP here uh, with customers uh, and uh, the, the, the push that I feel uh, it's not it's not fast enough. That's clear, but there's a lot of activity going on, and that's uh, that's uh, extremely positive. And finally, around digitalization, I mean, um, I I have seen Sea Green before, and this kind of digitalization will help us to be indeed uh, competitive on fair competition, and uh, uh, this is extremely important. Thank you very much. So, Leonardo, you, for Eurogroup, um, you are really flying on the wave of e-vehicles, electrification. Could you tell us what it means for you as a business leader? Yeah, we have uh, 57 years uh, uh, of experience making lamination for electric motors. And we know very well uh, how to work the steel made by Thyssen and uh, all the supplier that uh, we have uh, worldwide. And uh, in this... Um, uh, last year, starting 2015, uh, we more and more uh, um, use our experience to to help a company like uh, General Motors, all the OEMs. Uh, speak about General Motors because uh, in 2015 we start uh, an innovation project with them, and uh, it was a very strong collaboration. And uh, starting this moment, uh, we realized that uh, our job was. Uh, very important to sustain it, to help uh, companies, OEMs, making this transformation from industrial combustion engine to, uh, to electrification. And thanks to uh, our activity, our experience, uh, we started to realize that uh, our job was very important to connect uh, company like Thyssen with the supplier, with the customer like, uh, like uh, General Motors and all the OEMs, and this uh, was a very strong connection in order to obtain uh, very high efficient uh, motors for the, uh, for the uh, uh, transformation that uh, uh, we are living now. So, so you already mentioned it. Um, so let's jump right in um, because Miguel mentioned Seagreen. You mentioned the customer relationship. So maybe... Maybe we should tell the audience what brought us here together in a partnership to solve a customer problem. Roland, could you explain to us what our secret solution for decarbonization is? Yeah, let me start with the problem. And the problem is that in most cases, 80%, 80 maybe 90% of the emissions of a company are coming from scope three upstream, so from the supply chain. And uh, the other part is scope one and two. So, Take an example of Siemens, scope one and two is uh, half a million tons, whereas scope three upstream is 15 million roughly. So therefore, if you really want to go carbon neutral, you have to tackle this one. Um, here comes the problem. How can I get, trans first and foremost, transparency on what's my footprint along the scope three upstream? My supplier, supplier of supplier, and so on, back to the mine. Um, there are very limited amount of data, very often estimations. So let's assume you get your copper from a country, then obviously you apply the country electricity mix or whatever it is. So it's, it's, it's a rough estimation, not bad, but if you really want to get a full transparency, you, you need to have a, now we are talking about tools, digitalization tools to get, to get it. And then you can start also working on it at reducing it. So, and, um, and this was a problem also in one of our sites uh, in, in where we produce PLCs. And um, I mean, Gunther is also here in the audience. He, he said, yeah, I have, to, I have to tackle that problem. I want to, I want to get uh, transparency. So he gathered a bunch of smart people. Um, and they came up with an idea, which it's, and the, I try to explain it rather simply. Number one is, you should encourage the suppliers to put their data into a database in order to provide transparency. So the first idea was 
please give me your bill of materials and then I can put it in. Guess what happens? Um, this is core IPR, so they don't do that. So um, then they came with the idea and say, if I use this kind of a certification by third parties and I just put this certification into it, which is a um, hard coded, it's blockchain based, so it's, it's a really high level of in integrity. Okay, then the motivation was quite easy to say, now I can put my data into that. So, and, and along that idea, they developed C Green, which is a platform, which is again blockchain based, which encouraged suppliers to really put in their data on, on, on their carbon footprint, certified data with certifiers. We're working with certifiers too. And meanwhile, um, there's a, a bunch of companies who decided, for example, the chemical industry in Europe, they decided to use that tool now in order to create transparency. Automotive does it as well for Katinda X, and we talk about that. And the beauty is that today on the panel, you, you see the supply chain. You see, I mean, Tyson supplying to Eurogroup, then if you would have ZF, we would have another partner in the value chain supplying then to a car manufacturer, and they all use Seagreen. So you really see how Seagreen is, is deployed in, a, in, in, in one of the value chains of uh, supplying automotive customers. So I guess, Leonardo, that means yeah. for you, because you're, well, you're the one using Seagreen with Miguel. Yeah, when uh, uh, Mr. Gunter Betinker explained us uh, what is Seagreen, uh, I start to speak with our customer. You know, we have 90% uh, of the uh, EV platform in America, 50% in Europe, and uh, we are starting now to, to lead the uh, Asian market. And... Um, we start uh, sp to speak about this uh, a few months ago with uh, ZF, our customer, and uh, the answer is uh, why not? And uh, we start to with a pilot project that uh, we are managing now in uh, in Mexico for American market, uh, and we request to involve uh, uh, Tsen. Thank you very much to accept this uh, involvement, and uh, and we have a product uh, that is working. Uh, we are presenting this project uh, um, all the customers, and all of them, they, they are asking to implement immediately, as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, I have to thank you very much to Siemens uh, for this uh, kind of uh, pilot project and uh, all the activities that are making, making inside our company, uh, because uh, it's, uh, it, it's something new that, uh, 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 that is on the market, having the uh, ability to make measurement of the job that every day all the companies are making. This is very important because uh, uh, in a situation where uh, the competitiveness is very strong, the differentiation is very important. And this, uh, 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 as we know, is you cannot uh, improve, you cannot measure. And this is the way that uh, uh, in a granular way, we make a measurement of each component, and uh, all the improvements is uh, on the hand of the final customer. Uh, we can give this information to the final customer and uh, evaluate you know, which one have to buy. And this is uh, something very important. And Siemens give us this uh, uh, strong opportunity. Um, thank you very much. So Miguel, what enticed you to then use Seagreen, and what is the advantage for you? Well, um, I, I believe we, we need to add uh, an additional component to, to the conversation because um, when talking about fair competition, uh, of course, uh, Z Green is, is one element, but um, sp specifically in the steel production, cost of energy is extremely mm -hmm. important. And when looking to the imports into the EU, and that's what we are currently talking um, to the regulators, then the cost of energy of other countries, for example, China yeah. or India, is much lower than what we have in Europe. So it does mean it, it is not enough to have um, the, the coil uh, somehow z greened. It is also necessary that we have a certain kind of certification for the company as a, as a whole, so the steel company as a whole from whatever country it is. Why? because you can do one green coil, but you can have 80% of other production, which is gray. 
So this element of fair competition is extremely important. Um, and uh, I was thinking the other day when talking to the regulators, probably we need an institution like ISSB or something uh, similar to have not only the stamp on the coil as such, but also the stamp on the company overall, because what we are interested in is to get a complete green supply chain, as you mentioned before. So this is another element that is uh, extremely important from my point of view. Um, of course, we are now taking uh, our Bloomin steel uh, product, uh, thanks to Sea uh, Green, to customers, and this is giving us a competitive advantage. Nevertheless, we need to solve also the, the more trading um, mm. challenges as such as well. And this arena here, of course, is perfect. Uh, COP is perfect in order to, to address that and to talk with Al Jaba, with, uh, with Dr. Sultan, about this kind of, of things and address it correctly. And, and let me add, and th this is completely right. You have, to f you have to look at the full dimension. Number one, the company how you position yourself, what's your footprint, what is your uh, commitment on the one side. On the other side, and this is what, uh, and this is where Secret helps, but it helps also on the other end, that at the end of the day, you can really assign a, a carbon footprint to this bottle of water. Um, how many kilograms do you have? And you can even offset it in this platform. So this is a, these are the two important dimensions. Both of them are relevant for obvious reasons. One additional thing is energy efficiency. We are talking only or too much about the usage of energy, but we are not talking as much about energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is one fundamental piece to reduce carbon footprint as such. This is, this is really great. So. Um Miguel, your, your point about standards on green steel, what exactly it is and, and how to make it comparable globally is really a call to action to um, all the public parties that, that are there. And it shows the importance of public-private partnership. And I think at ThyssenKrupp, this is really essential as well for the transformation of your industry. Would you like to talk about that, the, the core pain points and how the public can help you with that? Well, I think uh, we, we first need to acknowledge that uh, the German government is doing a great job uh, because they have uh, been embarking on the, on the journey of uh, decarbonization and they were helping us, um, as you know, with the first uh, direct reduction plan, by the way, also in very strong cooperation with Europe, with the European Union. So this, this th three billion investment where we are getting two billion uh, as a... Um, as a risk, price risk mitigation mechanism uh, is uh, leading that we are uh, from 2028 using one third, until 2038, uh, one third of blue hydrogen and two thirds of green hydrogen. So the, the, the goal of this is to establish also a hydrogen value chain and infrastructure in Germany as such because we will, have, uh, we will have a demand of 140,000 tons of hydrogen uh, every year uh, with only one direct reduction plant. So this is, this is how the public-private um, uh, collaboration works in detail. Unfortunately, um, a couple of um, fellow steelmakers have not been getting the, uh, the, the, uh, this uh, support because of um, the decision of, of the uh, court um, in Germany the other day. But uh, we will support them also that they are getting their fair share because it needs to be always uh, fair. With this, we can really then match the demand of, of customers, whether OEMs or suppliers to OEMs, primarily in the uh, automotive industry. And we're sitting here together because you three formed a partnership to get real data on a CO2 footprint of a product for the customer. So Miguel just talked about the importance of public-private partnerships, but the, the potential for the industry is very much in building partnerships and ecosystems to tackle the challenges that this planet and society is facing. Roland, would you like to talk a little bit about the importance of partnerships, ecosystems, and the digitalization behind it as well? 
Yeah, and um, let me start with, with, with the sea green, which is, which is, you can see already how important this partnership of an ecosystem is, because the more suppliers, the more partners are adding their data to this platform, the more relevant it gets, obviously. And so therefore, this is, a, this is what we call technology-based platforms, which, uh, which multiply once you have more and more, more, and more users. So and, and I, I just can, can uh, reiterate what you said. This is a, a multi-dimensional problem which we have to solve. Um, basically, what, what we are doing now is when we make our shift in our energy system or any other system, it requires a tremendous amount of capex at, at the beginning because we want to save on opex on spending gas or anything. Of course, it has to be driven by efficiency because whatever kilowatt hour you don't consume at the end, you need, don't need to feed in maybe three at the, at the beginning. But at the same time, we need to invest in renewables, we need to invest in grids, um, we need to invest in charging spots, we need to invest in storage because renewables are per definition intermittent, so we are coming back to the hydrogen, not only for steel but also for, for storage. So you think about it, this is a, a massive transformation into a new world which requires a lot of uh, private investment and this invest to back this investment by governments uh, in order to drive number one innovation and I fully agree that you start working not only on green hydrogen, but also on blue one, because you really need to drive a lot of innovation in putting this innovation in sequence. So waiting until you have enough green, elect green electrons for green hydrogen is maybe not the right point. Of course, we have to go green. So this is a concerted effort of not only the government um, in order to play their role, and one of the big roles I see in government is also providing the infrastructure. That's particularly their role, but also of companies coming together um, along the supply chain uh, for certain industries um, that make sense to really link them and, and to make a concerted move. We see at the start, I'm very optimistic. If you look at my discussions here, COP28, it's more really about execution of doing things rather than debating whether or not you have to. So this is very positive. Still a work to do, I guess. I would like to propose you something. We have now starting with the cooperation in steel, but there's another sector which is extremely important to be decarbonized, and this is cement. Mm -hmm. Cement accounts for eight to 10% of all the CO2 emissions in the world. So what we have been doing now here for steel, we should uh, think about also to do it uh, as a partnership with the cement industry. Um, later today, we will, ha we will sign a, um, well, it's a surprise, I will not say anything, but um, the, what do you, the, <laughs> the um, you know, the, the, the need for decarbonizing uh, cement is huge. And until 2030, they need to be decarbonized, you know, carbon capture. Um, um, we have a technology to do that. And they need to be decarbonized because otherwise they plants will get not any longer competitive. And there are 2,300 cement plants worldwide. We have installed 800 of them. So there is, um, uh, there is a lot of um, potential to further, uh, further work on the partnerships. And it is needed to, to get really the things done. And Leonardo, we know it all starts and ends with a customer. So in, in Europe, Kubi, you're doing so much to anticipate the needs of your customer. Yes, well, uh, I think that the, the great opportunity that we have uh, having Sea Green as a tool to make a measurement where we are, make us uh, data numbers to understand what we can do, what we have to do in our shoulder and uh, in the shoulder of the, our suppliers. In, uh, in the pilot project that we have uh, with ZF, we show the data. Oh, it's very clear where it comes from the CO2 emission. We know that uh, every stack that we, we sell is um, 8.5 kilos uh, of CO2 emission. Well, 85% is coming from your steel that they have to know how to work on it. And uh, this end of a strong plan to reduce uh, the CO2 emission. And we have a part that is in our shoulder, no? as, as we said. Uh, and uh, we have a plan that uh, starting uh, now with a plan 2035, 20, we will reduce in, uh, in a plant in America, in Mexico, to 
uh, of 35% of the emission and to reach neutrality with our, our stage is, stage one is uh, uh, to, to go to zero in our project, go to zero CO2 emission 2050. Uh, it's, a, it's important to know where we are, to work on it and to make a plan. Uh, speak about uh, the way to use steel. We take care of the steel because uh, the great steel that the customer chose with us uh, with uh, an activity related with the uh, co-development of the processes, we found a way to the not lose uh, the good steel that we receive. This is important. It's a part of our job because we discovered that our task, our job to make a core rotor and stator, if you don't take care, you can damage the material and uh, lose a lot of effort made by the supplier uh, and, uh, and by the customer, after they, 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 they have to pay, you know, to, to lose uh, performance. You know? And we are there, constantly working, uh, in order to uh, increase the efficiency, you know, preserving the good characteristic of the material. This is very important, uh, and all of this is uh, measured by uh, a sea green that uh, every piece can control with the old system that we have, we have a backbone, Siemens backbone of informatic uh, technology where collect uh, uh, in a granular way all the activity related with the operation in order to understand exactly where we are. Uh, this is uh, the way that we are working. And let me put one more, one more party in this equation, which is the consumer itself. We see more and more consumers um, and consumers are more aware of want, there's more awareness on what's the footprint um, we talked about. Maybe that's a, that's a, a nice leeway to talk about our booth. If you can pass by, you will see there are two use cases, which I find brilliant. One is uh, we're, we're exposed to, in, the, in combination with BMW, a car with a battery passport. So that means the customer who buys a car can really look into this battery passport and see what is the content, what is the footprint, what is the percentage of recycled material used in this very same battery, along with very other interesting information, which is what is the capacity, what is the still maximum capacity compared to the specification and so on. The other extreme is you can get a coffee and uh, you know what, if you order a latte macchiato, you, you get to know what is the footprint of your, of your latte macchiato. So um, still enjoy it, but, uh, but you know, this is, you have to get the consumers also informed. Once you are informed about the footprint, then you can make choices. So this is really the big difference what we can make if you bring this technology all the way together from, from the supply chain Maybe even from the mine, I'm pretty sure when we talk about there should be another person sitting next to me from the mine, yes. which is filling the data into your sea green uh, database and so on and so on. So therefore, that, that's, that's the whole idea behind it and get to move a lot of, a lot of legs at the same time. I, I love it because it also shows very much that our customers require us to think bigger. I mean, as much as climate is part of planetary boundaries, decarbonization is part of resource efficiency and biodiversity and at, at the end circularity so if we now think a little bit bigger what does our customer really need it's really about the end the pain point and the outcome that industry is now working to deliver it's is reinventing ourselves thinking new about innovation and technology and how we can address the customer need Miguel how, how do you look at that well, I mean, it's, it's very much also about transparency, communication, and uh, education, you know. Uh, I see that now, um, since we created the decarbon technologies segment in, in Tussenkrupp, we did that October 1st, um, we are doing really information communication campaigns to get uh, not only customers, consumers, but also our own people um, aware of the first of the need for doing decarbonization, second, uh, that this is a purpose beyond business and that's what, what it should be. Sustainability is a purpose, it needs to be business, but it is more. 
and um, to get also uh, the actions more defined in terms of how many electrolyzers we want to, we want to make, we will offer, how many ammonia plants, how many green chemicals can we do, how many um, um, plants, cement plants we can decarbonize, and uh, how many uh, windmills we can um, drive with our bearings. So all this, um, in terms of getting the message better across, um, is, uh, is extremely important. And one thing for, uh, for sea green applications, I don't know how to do it, but it, I think energy as such is a very important factor. Because it's, you know, you said the, the mine, and uh, the mine is one source, primary source, but the energy is the other primary source, and how to get this uh, transparent. You know, because if we talk about steel, uh, you know, we can uh, have a direct reduction uh, plant, but we can have also HP, uh, HPI. And if it's HPI, we are getting uh, a product from a third party, which is already some steel uh, produced. And this needs also to be, then uh, this part of the value chain needs also to be controlled. And there, it's important w what the energy is. Green, blue, gray, whatever. So transparency, communication, education, clear action plans. Well, uh, as I said, starting 2015, our job changed dramatically. And this is because we understood that the market, the request of the market was different. Not only making lamination, buying the steel, but uh, working with the customer, uh, helping the customer to make the right choice and developing with them how to use better the steel. And uh, starting this moment, we started to make a deep uh, activity, starting our plants, where the people go to, we send them to go to school, start the operator to the middle management to high level the people, in order to be able to understand better and better the technology and to be able to make innovation. We are making, um, strong, important innovation in our field. Uh, one of these is, uh, for example, to separate the production of rotor and the stator because uh, rotor and stator, two elements that are uh, part of the electrical motors. And uh, in the past, until now, you know, when we ask the steel mill, uh, steel is uh, to make a boat, you know, because the process need to use, we have to optimize the usage of the steel. And for these reasons, no, <clears throat> we ask one steel to make rotor the stator. Now, because we are able to make, uh, thanks to the innovation, the possibility, this uh, a new uh, uh, way to make uh, rotor uh, the stator, we can ask uh, uh, to the steel mill separated material, one for the rotor, one for the stator. This uh, open a new, um, uh, it's a new way to understand the motors, increasing efficiency, uh, having better uh, usage of the material, and this overall is uh, increasing uh, uh, taking care of the sustainability. Uh, not, not only because we are deeply involving uh, suppliers like Thyssen and uh, with university and laboratory to make better the job that we know whatever to do, whatever to be, and speaking with the supplier and with the customer to make the real bridge. Uh, this is uh, a big step change and we discover that uh, we are obtaining uh, huge uh, acceptance of the market because they know the value uh, of what we are doing and the way to make a measurement of this is sea green. Thank you. And Roland, how does Siemens anticipate the customer's desired outcome and sustainability in, in, through innovation? I mean, first and foremost, talking to them. But also, I mean, there are two dimensions, obviously. There's a regulation kicking in, which is driving it, and the other side is uh, customers. And we have a lot of leading customers who say, we go our own way. Um, we want to make our contribution, and we go very, very aggressive um, for carbon neutrality as fast as possible. So. Therefore, I mean, it's a constant dialogue. 
Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, the, the big elephant in the room is obviously, does it cost more? I mean, if I ask you for green steel today, there might be an extra price. Question is, is our customers paying for it? Is our customer's customer paying for it? Is the end customer paying for it? Um, and this brings me back to the point, um, maybe a customer, end customer pays for it, but not if it's not transparent. If you don't have a choice, this is the footprint of a product A, this is a footprint of a product B, and then you have a choice. We, I saw yesterday on our booth an analysis of, of our suppliers supplying very, the same part, and it varies by a factor of 11, I guess, on the carbon footprint. So you, once you have a choice, then you, then you can go for it. The pressure is, is there. I mean, we see that um, when maybe five years back, uh, people were talking about what are the targets. Now it's not about talking about, it's really about executing. How can I get as fast as possible? There's one dimension I would like to bring into this whole discussion. One is efficiency. I fully agree. I mean, drive it as fast, as hard as you can, because this is the ultimate target to get also your, your ultimate demand down. The second one is definitely trying to um, eliminate every kind of carbon footprint along the value chain. But the third element, and to talked about it, is recycling. Uh, I do know that if you can recycle aluminum, for example, that reduces your energy input by maybe, whatever, 70, 80%, and same for steel. Problem is that if you recycle high-value steel, you downgrade it to construction steel. But real recycling means go for high-value steel and recycle it to high-value steel so you can reuse it in the value chain. That's, for me, a, another challenge. And guess what? the answer? Technology. I do believe there's technology there which we need to develop even further and to deploy. And the other question is, who, is, who, 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 are, the, who are the players in that market? Who, who has the business model to collect the stuff from the field, bring it back, recycle it? In particular, if it's not I mean, it's steel, it maybe goes back to you guys because you have the smelters. But if you have particular materials which occur in very, very limited amounts, I mean, talk about batteries, lithium, cobalt, nickel, whatever, who does it and how can we do that as effective and efficient as possible? Mm -hmm. So by when can we recycle high-value steel to high-value steel? That's a fantastic question, and um, we are working with, with many institutes, as you, as you know, uh, in order to, to get the innovations um, for our, our customers, of course, uh, done, the, the efficiency up. Um, the, good, the good news, you mentioned it already, is that we already recycle today, but downgraded to, to lower qualities, for sure. Um, and um, I would like to take your competitiveness point uh, again in order to address uh, the need for fair competition. Um, and uh, again, uh, this, this is a very, very big issue for, for us, for European steelmakers, because we are suffering from, uh, from a lot of imports that are not, um, well, um, having the same preconditions as, as we do. And uh, this is something that uh, where public-private partnership kicks in again, but also the value chain, you know. Uh, today, uh, green, green steel may get a premium, but I'm not really sure whether in five years from now or eight years from now, the consumer will really pay for the different... I mean, I don't think so. I, I think this, 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 will, this will be... Uh, very fast, you will get under pressure from uh, o OEMs, and, and the OEMs uh, they they will they will not pay 200 euros more for a ton of steel. And if uh, if we take a, a, a current well a battery uh, car, an EV, we know how many tons uh, the car is, and most of the tons is steel or aluminium. Aluminium applies the same. So competitiveness needs to be there for sure, but we need to figure out how we get this done in a fair, uh, in a fair, um, in a fair way. That's very important because we have responsibility for our people. We have responsibility for for the uh, wealth in, in Europe as well. Of course, also in other countries. But this is a very U European topic because of what I mentioned before: the very high energy prices that we have here compared to other uh, regions in the world. So, competitiveness. Very clear. In ten years from now, nobody will 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 get you more 
uh, paid for uh, for anything green, but uh, we need to do it in a fair way, and that's what that's our task to do that. Well, um, I agree. I agree with you, uh, but it's clear that we don't have the answer now. But uh, we we can have answer working together because uh, we have a request of the customers that said sit together and work together to understand what we can do. Um, and the, speak about uh, like the necessity to recycle, to take care of the life of the, the product. Uh, starting uh, two years ago in, uh, in Mexico, uh, the state of Creta requested to us to be a, um, um, a lead, to lead a group uh, of company, Italian company in Querétaro. Uh, I'm Italian consul in, uh, in Mexico, and uh, they ask us to, to lead the Italian companies to, to work in a, in a program that is uh, take care of the life of the material to put in, in production, in, uh, in the market. And, uh, and the Querétaro, that we will meet tomorrow, with the governor will be in our stand, your stand, and um, and uh, Querétaro start uh, two years ago to put a tax. I cannot tell them this tax because it's a, it's a contribution for the projects. No, but it, it's, it's true. It's, uh, they use this money. We pay uh, thirty dollars each ton of CO2 emission, and they take this uh, tax. No, sorry, this contribution to um, uh, to, make, to put in place. Uh, um, uh, a project to reduce the CO2 emission. Uh, this is a very great project. I, I ask uh, uh, Mr. Gunther Bettinger to be involved in this project because uh, what I'd like to do as a, a CEO of the company to use this tax no, sorry, contribution in order to, to obtain a certification now to set off you know, the, the CO2 emission. Is that, uh, it's a great job. It's the way that uh, I think we have to work on it. Um, I think that uh, uh, if you stay together, we will find a way to to be competitive with innovation. Uh, it's, uh, I, Another, I this is a great example where everything is coming together. I mean, and the government says, I mean, the company is producing here. They have to meet their targets. If not. They have to pay $30 per ton of CO2, but this money goes directly into a forestation um, community, indigenous people who are foresting, so they are capturing carbon. And, and, and again, making this whole thing transparent, so it moves, it needs a platform, which is green again. They can really see it's, it's the demand and the offset, so, and, and you bring it together with a certain price. But I believe it's, it's a very smart idea uh, to drive the, the whole system and it will, it will drive efficiency and effectiveness. So, I mean, this is your point. In, in 10 years from now, you don't get on too much of an extra price. We have to go, and, and you, you started the whole, th the whole panel here with saying it's not only about going sustainable and resilient, but it's also about being competitive, cost competitive as well. There are opportunities, and there are very good examples how we can get there. And it also shows that you're thinking about the communities you, you basically work with and in and live in, which is a very important part of sustainability as well. Now, I want to touch on something that Miguel mentioned earlier. So when we look at the speed of the transition that is required, so when we fully think through that we have to cut 40% of CO2 in the next six years, we are looking at the biggest deployment of capital since World War II. Now, you're all sitting here as European companies with, with long and strong traditions and cultures. But this is not going to be linear. It's like we have a six-year window and we have a, an S-curve. So how, how do you manage to take all of your employees along on this ride that is really coming at us with full speed? So first of all, uh, speed, just one uh, data point. To fulfill the plans, the, the worldwide plans, we would need 1,000 gigawatt renewable energy installed every year. 
last year we installed 300. So we are way, way too late, way too late. And of course, the, the other thing is um, all the, you know, interest rates development was killing a lot of renewable projects. So, I mean, we, we are working on many, many things um, um, w with partnerships within the company, but the overall picture, I mean, it will be discussed here, is not good. We need to, we need to find the ways to get the, the things done much, much faster. Looking to, to Syncope, I mean, I was saying the other day, we are, we are the, the, the climate activist number one in Germany because we, we are decarbonizing the, the steel, which is, a, we have been talking about this before, it's a very large, we are 2.5% we are of all the CO2 emissions in Germany, 2.5%. So we, we, we are working very hard on this and to get, uh, to get the things done in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, the other thing is, um, and I mentioned this as well, so this decarbon technologies is of course giving a lot of visibility about the importance, I mentioned it before, for our people um, and of course the ESG uh, program that we are driving, but the good thing in, in our case is that we have this green transformation, two big things on the agenda uh, and, 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 and people um, I think are very proud that we are driving this so uh, intensely. Well, I mean, taking, uh, taking the people with, with us, um, we talk about 320,000 people at Siemens, I think it's a, it's a combination. Number one, I do believe all of them got the message that we have to do something in order to um, save our planet or, or help human uh, um, further develop in, a, in an environment which we should not damage too much. So this is number one. Number two is, um, they do know that we have the technology which is, which is helping our customers and our customers' customers to make a change. So there's an intrinsic motivation. The third element, of course, is creating success, which obviously makes it easier to buy into. So it's not about running a company and then running it um, and uh, the, getting the financials down while making a sustainable agenda. No, it's both. I think this combination is very important. And, and you can do that. So therefore, I, I fully agree. It's getting tougher. I mean, when, when you talk about half-time um, stock taking, and uh, we say we, we saved already 60%, 40 to go, we would say it's great, now we are ahead, but the problem is that the, the low-hanging fruits are done, so now it's really getting really tough. Which brings me to the point that if you really want to take these 40% and tackle them, while having higher interest rates, and everybody knows it's all about investment, it's CAPEX, which we have to do, um, I mean, it's capital allocation. Bring the capital deployed at the point where it can make the biggest impact um, on uh, euro investment in getting a ton of CO2 reduction. This is a global task. This is maybe the reason why COP is, is, is even more important than ever before. The global task is how can deploy, how can raise the capital and deploy it in the most effective way in order to bring it to the point where it saves the most. That, that's a task, and it requires a joint effort, uh, a little bit boundaryless, I have to say. Well, I think that uh, uh, we are living a situation, a very special, special moment in the world, in particular in our, uh, our field that is automotive, uh, where uh, uh, Asian market, they lead uh, capacity to be able to stay on the market. Uh, they are uh, able to have a perfect product with a 35, 40% less cost. And I think that uh, uh, it's important this COP28 have to take consideration what have to do, what is uh, the decision of, uh, of the governments to deal with a situation where uh, um, uh, yeah, can be disruptive on the market. For sure, staying uh, in, in our, uh, our market, our job, we have plants worldwide. And uh, we have a customer worldwide. Where the customer asks, we are there to uh, supply them. Uh, of course, the situation where we are now, 
we have to increase a lot as we are doing a lot of companies our operation in China because uh, they are good they are very able to make a good uh, product with a competitive price probably no all time they stay on uh, on the limit linked with the CO2 emission but is it a fact no and the COP28 have to give us answer in this situation in my opinion and if we um, we are coming a little bit towards the end of our time together, so let's make sure we're touching on the future. If you're looking, let's say until 2030, what is your what are your strategic priorities and what is your vision for 2030? Roland, do you want to start? Well, I mean, number one is we have a commitment uh, going for 2030 to go uh, with scope one and two down to basically zero. That's, uh, we're investing another 600 million to do that. So this is a clear commitment. I think we get there. Number two is uh, we're talking about scope three upstream. Um, they have a long way to go. Uh, we said we want to reduce by minus 20%, go zero by 2050. This is particularly difficult because this growth speaks against it. The more you grow, the more material you buy, so you have to comp overcompensate for whatever growth you have. So that's, that's heavy lifting, and that requires a lot of effort, deploying our technologies, using Seagreen, creating transparency, but also work with, with companies like, like Kirsten to see can, how can we buy green steel and the like for competitive prices, so this is another one. And to be honest, my, my real focus is, is, is downstream. 90% um, of our portfolio is, is uh, carbon, supporting the carbon reduction, or is green, as you want. And uh, to really think about how can we deploy our technology faster, because this has the biggest, biggest, single biggest impact on the market. So I talked about half a million tons, scope one and two, some 15 million upstream. And we talk hundreds of millions of tons if you talk downstream. Um, and this cuts across all our industries because we provide efficient drives, we provide software and technology which avoids um, uh, failure in your design, avoids resources which you, which you spoil because you do that. We have uh, the most efficient trains, green, green transport is, is public transport. So there's a lot of things we can do, so therefore this is maybe the biggest the biggest uh, challenge and opportunity you have to really bring this technology to the market. I cannot agree more because, I mean, the internal program is clear, but our challenge is how to ramp up the capacities for producing electrolyzers for the customers. How do we ramp up the capacities? How do we standardize, modularize all the um, equipment for green chemicals? How do we ramp up this in order to support the decarbonization of our customers? How do we ramp up all what we need to do to decarbonize people, um, teams, um, specialists, um, knowledgeable uh, groups of people to decarbonize the cement industry? How do we ramp up all, all this? So there's a big opportunity also for, for, um, for the, 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 the people, for enhancing um, the, the uh, real power of Tristan Group in terms of decarbonizing. So the, the, the more challenge I see is how to ramp up all these elements that I just uh, said and how to manage that, of course, um, profitable and, and in a competitive uh, manner. Well, uh, it's clear now having a C green as a product, we can measure uh, our way to proceed during the years uh, with, the, with a program that we call Go to Zero Project. Uh, uh, and 2030 will be reduction of CO2 emission, as we already stated for America, is uh, to reach a reduction of 35% of CO2 with objective to go to uh, uh, zero 2050. Uh, speak about scope one. Uh, about uh, scope three is depending on the customer request and the ability to have uh, the raw material available with a uh, low CO2 emission. Um, uh, it's important the job that we are doing with the uh, govern government like uh, Caretaro 
uh, where uh, the activity uh, linked with um, uh, a systematic approach, not only related with the uh, customer supply, but uh, uh, think ratio on the life of, uh, of our product is a, is a very important activity that uh, we will work on it uh, in order to be more and more effective uh, in, in the direction to be sustainable. So the, the motto of this COP is unite, act and deliver. If you could wish for one thing as an outcome of this COP, what would it be? Roland, would you like to start? Yeah, um, very simple, a global carbon price. <laughs> Give you a little bit of an idea behind And you, you said make a wish. I know it's, it's, uh, it's hard, but the point is, I talked about, um, or you talked about that maybe there's a problem if you have a carbon reduction here and you have imports from other countries with lower prices because they don't fill the requirements. So, I mean, all these carbon border adjustments, I mean, you can get rid of if you say, I mean, you have a global carbon price, that's about it. We need a, a, a price and a mechanism how it's increasing steadily by time, which allows finally, and, and, then, and then we don't need this, what I see in some countries, the micromanagement of governments where they want to steer money into certain corners. That's all gone. Once you have a global carbon price and it's steadily increasing, I tell you, the money will flow where the return is. So that would be my wish. I take this one. <laughs> and, uh, and um, but by the way, this is a big, big debate, as, as you know, the big debate, uh, because uh, there are so many interests uh, in, in, in this world. But what I would like to see is a clear plan how we ramp up the renewable capacity installation, because that's the that's the basic thing in order to get the whole thing done. You know, uh, renewable capacity, who is, which country commits to what, and then to, to get the things really, uh, to get the permits, to get uh, whatever is needed in terms of acceptance of the public. Yeah? We are not having the right level of installations of uh, renewable capacity because population is not always allowing it. So I would like to wish how, um, how we configure, to configure a plan for um, ramping up much faster the renewable installation capacity. Well, um, I'd like to, to close this, uh, uh, speak about uh, ourselves, what we can do uh, more and more. And, uh, um, I'm an expert about innovation, and uh, I think that uh, uh, working deeply in this uh, field uh, with the base of our know-how and uh, with training, with the school, I think that uh, starting our job that we make every day uh, with our team, with our people, I think that we can uh, make a strong improvement in our uh, uh, environment. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much to everyone who has joined us today at this panel at the ICC Live from COP. You have heard three visionary CEOs who unite, act, and deliver. Is it enough? It's not enough yet. But it also needs to work together with government and NGOs. This is why they're here at COP, investing the time, supporting the cause, supporting governments and NGOs, and looking forward to solving this channel together. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.